Coming to you from our nation's capital. The horror. <laughs> it's the little podcast of horrors with James, Christina, and Chris. Welcome to yet another episode of Little Podcast of Horrors. That's right. We're still around and we're still going. <laughs> we're still here. We're still you here. You tried to us. stop us. But you failed. You failed <laughs> miserably. What's up, everybody? How are you guys? Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, you jazzed Chillaxin. up. She's <laughs> chill. She's relaxing and what? How that's oh, how the lyrics go? Chillaxing and relaxing and looking all cool or something like that. What Fresh are we pizza. drinking today? Water. Water. <laughs> I'm get, I've so got. I'm- I'm indulging in one of my favorites. So this is uh, called Darkness Falls. Whoa. <laughs> Darkness <laughs> falls throughout the land. The midnight hour is close oh, I figured hand. it was appropriate for, you know, a podcast episode. But it's a coconut milk mm. stout. Barely. Yummy. That does is that good. one that I had when I was there last? Uh, I don't know. But I have another one. So you, you can get to try it. Well, you gave oh, me no, like no, a I coconut had you try stout. Coconut, but it, no, I had you try something crazier, coconut. Oh, it was good, I whatever it was. It. Yeah, this isn't as much. No, the one you had was a. Uh, oh, it's called. Uh, I think it was like a. Would you like? Would you like cocoa or nut? Is the name of the beer. Oh okay, yeah. Hey, okay. I love coconut, so that was super good. Coca. Would you like coconut? Cocoa coconut. Or nut? Cocoa or nut? cocoa or nuts. Coco or not. Uh, Actually, I'm going to write that down because that was good. Yeah. But uh, yeah, this one is also an excellent coconut stout. It's just yeah. not quite as much a punch in the face as that one was. Excuse me. Yeah. Darkness falls. The darkness of coconut. Delicious. The darkness of coconut. Sorry, just that line makes me think of Thriller. Darkness falls throughout the land. The midnight hour is close at hand. Creatures <laughs> crawl in search of blood to terrorize your neighborhood. But yeah, listeners, if 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 you like coconut flavored beer stuff, like what Christina was talking about, would you like cocoa or nuts? Which I want to say it's Evil Twin Brewing, who I think is out of New York. And then what I'm having today is Darkness Falls Coconut Stout, which is out of Martin House Brewery in Fort Worth, Texas. James is definitely the one that to talk to about very yummy, delicious. I just beers. drink dessert. Yeah, he drinks dessert. His beers are just dessert. Like if you're <laughs> wanting to be like, hey, well, Bud Light or Miller Light, James may not be the guy to talk to you. But if you're wanting, if you're wanting like um, a s'mores in beer form, James is your man. Oh, I got, I got that. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and he's had all of us try it, and it tastes like a s'more. It's delish. Well, I'm hosting today's episode. You are. I am. Do you like my little background? It goes along with what my story is going to be. I do. About trees? No. It's what else is trees. in the, what else is in the picture? Do you know what that Fog. is? Fog. This is Washington, DC. Oh, it's the bench. You're talking about the bench, aren't you? I'm you I can't with you today. <laughs> Kids. You know, in throughout this series, we've talked a lot about yours truly loves to talk about ghosts. Uh, I'm kind of the ghost guy of the group, you know, and we've gone to haunted locations already. Um, but one That's of the things uh, but the thing is about me is that I am a history major. I was a history major in college. I, I was I graduated with a degree in history. So I love it. It's something I enjoy along with ghosts. So when I can find a way to combine history and the paranormal, I do that. And last season, uh, early on, we talked about the LaLaurie Mansion, I remember, in New Orleans, a town that is rife with ghosts. So it should be no surprise to anybody that our nation's capital is also rife with ghost stories. Haunted AF. Haunted AF. 
And I mean, that's not that shouldn't well, really surprise DC. Yeah, it shouldn't surprise anybody <laughs> either. I mean, DC is it's it's it. I have wanted to go to Washington DC most of my life. I mean, if you love history, this is the place to be. And the thing about ghosts are often connected to historical things of historical significance. I mean, like we've talked about Amelia Earhart. Her her plane is there in the Smithsonian. Um, you know, you've got the White House. We've got the Washington Monument. You've got the Capitol building. And while I was researching for this story, <laughs> I had to narrow it down to just three locations. I could probably spend several episodes talking about all of the haunted locations in Washington, D.C. You've got Ford's Theater, where Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. People have reported seeing his ghost there, and John Wilkes Booth's specter running across the stage, almost like they're replaying that night. Um, you've got the Capitol building, where there is supposedly a demon cat that appears right before Ooh. right before calamities. Okay. Yeah. So, are you going to do a Washington D.C. series? Yes, I am. So, I think I'm planning to do for future episodes. I'm going to be doing a a a series on D.C., um, which is actually going to go into my more further, my more larger scale project of doing haunted cities in general. Um, so, be- oh, are ghosts just bougie? Because it's like you know, if you've got a big <laughs> historical place like DC or some European castle or whatever, you're getting ghosts. You're definitely getting some ghosts. Crescent Hotel, Stanley Hotel, Big Bougie Hotel, you're getting ghosts. But not it's much far less often that just some rando's house gets haunted. Because like they don't care about most of them. I guess there's some lower class ghosts that go for the house for Joe Bolo's house. But most of them they're going for the big big historical houses, the big mansions, DC like they're they're high rolling ghosts. Well, the thing is with a lot of these places, I mean like even with with the research of all these these places, like they're always seeped in tragedy, you know, a lot of them on location deaths. I mean, like well, I was going to say like one of them that I I'll just touch on briefly, but I may go into more in a future episode is like the Decatur House. It's supposed to be um haunted by Commodore John Decatur, who died in a duel prematurely. You know, you have the Surratt house. Um, Mary Surratt was the first female hung for uh, by the United States uh, because she was uh, implicated in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And her ghost is seen in the Surratt house because she ran a boarding house. And she's also seen in, in another several other structures. That's the other thing, too, is... Some of these ghosts don't just haunt one place that we're going to talk about. Some of them haunt, huh? They're mobile. They're mobile. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, just wait. So, well, that's good. You don't want to be trapped in one spot, right? Right. That's right. So, and some of these people are not. They're ghosts, man. They, I hope they're riding around in like a, a scary ghost chariot pulled by ghost horses with red eyes. But you don't know ghost <laughs> rules. You don't know how they traverse a, lo- a a large geographical area. I don't know, man. How they get from point A to point B. I don't know. But the neat thing is, too, is that amongst these ghost stories is real history. You know? And that's what I really enjoy, too. Whether you believe in the ghosts or you don't, they are seeped in actual real history. And tragic as some of the stories are they're still fascinating to read about they're interesting to learn because they're part of our nation's history so with that said we're going to jump into the first location which is known as the woodrow wilson house so for anybody who lived there take a wild (laughs) get abraham lincoln abraham lincoln no (laughs) woodrow wilson who was the 28th president of the United States, serving as president from 1913 to 1921. I got to know, I got to admit too, when I was researching this, I've been very interested in presidential history. Like I can name all the presidents, but I can't say that I know a lot about 
a lot of the presidents. I mean, we know the big ones like George Washington, John Adams, Abraham Lincoln, but like Garfield, we, Garfield, who and, was assassinated uh, in a train station. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. President Garfield was assassinated. He was elected in 1880. And that's not even my notes. I just know that he was elected in 1880. He was shot um, in a train station. I want to say 1881. Yeah. So I told you, I like I like presidential history, but I you don't. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I I wonder a lot actually if because like there's the here right now perspective why we're while we're alive and then the perspective of greater history, like the presidents in our lifetime, you know, depending on what generation you are, but like for me, you know, Reagan, Bush, Bush, Clinton, etc. Like to me, each of those presidents was a big deal. But I wonder, in a long march of history, years later, how many of them are going to basically going to be a Garfield? Yeah, or Franklin Pierce. Yeah, Franklin Pierce. Like those are just like maybe Clinton was a big deal to us with Monica Lewinsky scandal and Iron Contra and all those juicy, juicy things that people have opinions on. But like fifty years from now, I'll be like, oh yeah, to who to <laughs> be on the list yeah. that no remembers? Yeah, or like yeah. You know, I guess, I guess 150 years from now. Yeah. How many of there are going to be Chester A. Arthur's, you know? Right. But uh, I don't know. Well, the thing is, and it's, you know, it's a good point. You you raise a good point because you would think Woodrow Wilson, we know, I would have known more about Woodrow Wilson. And I realized researching this, I didn't. So Woodrow Wilson, he was the 28th, like I said, he was the 28th president of the United States. Now, the first thing of interesting note about Wilson's presidency, his wife, First Lady Ellen Wilson, died due to Bright's disease just a year into his first term. So right there, I mean, that's that. I mean, like, could you imagine that today? Like the First Lady dying. What's you know? Bright's disease? It's a kidney disease. Um, oh, it's an infection okay. of the kidney, basically. Um, so, yeah, right off the bat, like that's great historical significance because i mean how many first ladies have died during office i couldn't say but no clue that first lady ellen wilson was one of them um and because of this we had another first because he eventually remarried um after meeting edith bowling galt at a white house tea party you also have a president getting married while president so that's kind of a big yeah, that doesn't too. happen that doesn't yeah. happen you don't see the president getting married. Not like know that ever happened. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. it's happened a, a couple of times. I know that. Uh, I want to say Rover Cleveland also married. Once again, I'm pulling from memory. And listeners, uh, you can correct me. I'll probably look it up later. But I believe Grover Cleveland married, and the wedding was actually at the White House. So yeah, I guess I just always subconsciously assumed there's an unspoken rule that you had to be married to be president. Oh, no. In fact, another fun tidbit. The reason we have the term first lady, the first time it was ever used, wasn't even for the president's wife. James Buchanan, who was the 15th president of the United States, who was not married, and many people believed he may it may be because he was actually gay. Um, his niece did all the roles of the president's wife during that time, and she was the first one to actually carry the title first lady. Oh, so that's neat. Uh, yeah, but uh, but the other thing, too, that's kind of interesting about Woodrow Wilson's presidency, as I said, he was president from 1913 to 1921. So what was one of the biggest historical moments in the world that happened during that time? Guess. Can't think of it. What did you say? What year? Between 1913 and oh. 1921. That was a boring period. Think World about War I. World War One. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he, he James was is like I'm drawing a blank. I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> yeah, Woodrow Wilson. He presided. He was the president who, uh, while we were involved in the First World War, um, tragically, Wilson actually suffered a stroke two years before his second term ended, and it actually rendered him paralyzed on his left side and only partial vision in his right eye. So um, so he actually had paralysis of his face. So it kind of, it disfigured him, it, it, you know. 
tragically, which I didn't know that. I see right there off the bat. So after his second term ended, the couple actually moved into what would become known as the Wilson House. And it's actually located on NBC Row in Washington. Um, Woodrow Wilson actually purchased it as a gift to his wife. Um, and Wilson actually died here in 1924. So he only got to enjoy it for about three years um, before he passed away. Um, and after the death of Mrs. Wilson, the house was opened as a museum. In 1963, the house itself um, was actually built in 1916 by architect Waddy Butler Wood. Um, and the uh, and the first resident of the home was actually a Henry Parker Fairbanks. Um, he was actually an executive at the Bigelow Carpet Company. Uh, the home actually boasts a beautiful stately gardens, a marble entryway, and a library with over 8,000 books. And it's actually in this library where President Wilson would give his final national address. Um, he actually gave it in November of 1923, and then he passed away that February just some months later. And I actually listened to the address. Go ahead. Are those original books still there? Yes, I'm going to get to that, too. Oh, my gosh. I want to see the books. <laughs> oh, so the home today, it's actually been preserved as it was during Wilson's time. It's like a time capsule. So when you go into this home, it's just like walking into the 1920s. Like they've preserved everything. Wilson. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, all the books are there. It's beautiful. And like I said, this is he gave his last address. Um uh, commemorating the anniversary of the end of World War I um, from the library. You can actually listen to it online. I listened to it the other day while I was doing some research for when I was researching for this episode. So that's just to give you a little bit brief backstory on the house. Now the fun part. The reason we're all here, kids. The ghosts. Since its opening, staff and guests have reported a number of ghostly occurrences. You have everything for, have anything from doors opening by themselves, lights flickering, disembodied voices. But the part that's kind of the reason I kind of zeroed in on this one this particular house was uh, the fact that people have seen Woodrow himself. So he has his office and he has his desk, and then he also has his rocking chair. People have actually come in and claimed to have seen the apparition of Wilson sitting at his desk or in the rocking chair or by the window. And he, when they see him, he appears as a transparent figure wearing a shirt, tie, and jacket. But the, the part that really kind of freaks me out, his face is disfigured due to the paralytic stroke. Oh, remember I said wow. part of, yeah. Um, all, they also often hear what they believe is him because it's footsteps followed by what sounds like a cane in the hallways because he had to use a cane after his stroke. Mm -hmm. um, the activity got so bad that the caretaker uh, quit in 1969. He just could oh. not. He, yeah. He said things just kept happening and seeing. And the thing is, I mean, imagine that you're like, you're the caretaker of this historic home and you just walk into a room and there's Woodrow Wilson just sitting there at the desk. That'd be crazy. <laughs> I mean, I would oh, quit. Pardon me, sir. <laughs> I don't. I don't think I could handle that. It's like there'd be that part of me that would just be really interested. Like, oh my god, I'm meeting the ghost of Woodrow Wilson. But then there's that other part of me. He's like, I'm meeting the ghost of Woodrow Wilson. Right. I'd just be like, <laughs> oh, be like, no. I know. I, I, I've wondered, like, man, it's bad enough to be stuck to a place to have to haunt it. I was like. Do, do I have to haunt it as in the state that I died in? Like, why can't I haunt it as like sexy twenty something me? Oh yeah, yeah, really, yeah, yeah. Woodrow was a good looking young man too. Yeah, it's like, yeah, like he like, and that's the other thing too. Like when they see him, he's partially disfigured from his stroke. I'm like, really? That's how he Wait, is. Go ahead. Do do they do they think it's one of those um, like imprints where? He's not, uh, what am I trying to say? Where he it, can't it, like interact with you, but like he's just an imprint there. Yeah. I, and I, I didn't see anything that 
definitively clarified that, but it seems that's the case. What the hell was that? Okay, so for people that cannot see, I I have like a LGBTQIA plus uh, ribbon thingy frame. And I'm just sitting here and then suddenly all these balloons <laughs> came was up. Amazing. I thought Pennywise was about <laughs> to take you. I was just about to spit my drink out when that happened. <laughs> wow. Like, what the fuck is that? Okay, I'm sorry, Chris, what were you saying? <laughs> no, I was going to say, but yeah, from all reports, it seems to see, it seems like it's a, I'm trying to think of the term too. I know what you're saying. More or less what it is, is that there are two types of hauntings. There are the hauntings that they interact with you. They seem to acknowledge your presence. But then there's these other types of hauntings where it just seems like it's it's a visual imprint. Like you're not so much seeing their ghosts, but you're just seeing the past replay itself. And that comes from the belief that places can hold energy and after, and oftentimes kind of just it's like replayed on a loop. And so – you look at it more as less as seeing like you're seeing their the spirits of the dead person and you're just seeing more of the past bleeding through to the present maybe so mm-hmm. um so that that definitely might be the case especially since the fact that they've preserved that house like like i was looking at photographs i want to go in this house so bad just because of like it's like walking back in time i mean the kitchen the library, the office. Yeah, check it out. Um, so it's it's really yeah, I'm neat. Pictures of it and it looks amazing, especially yeah. the library. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the library is gorgeous. Um, this is definitely one of my top places I want to visit when I eventually get to go to Washington, DC. This is really pretty. Okay, I'm gonna put pictures on our social media for it. So, but that's that's as but the thing is that's as far as it goes with the Woodrow Wilson house. Um, just constant occurrences door. Like I said, doors opening, disembodied voices, your typical haunts. Um, and it, it, and it seems to be Woodrow that if there is a ghost in the house, it's Woodrow Wilson, who seems to be residing there. Moving on to our second location though. Uh, it is the Hay Adams hotel trigger warning. There is talk, uh, talks of suicide in this story so uh, listeners discretion advised our show has a knack for investigating haunted hotels <laughs> so this is another place that maybe we should check out someday in the future um the hotel sits just a thousand feet from the white house it's actually named for henry adams and john hay whose homes once sat where the hotel is now <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now, John Hay, uh, just to give you a little history lesson here. John Hay was the personal secretary to President Lincoln. He was also the U.S. ambassador to the United Kingdom. And he was also the secretary of state under William, Kim, William McKinley and Teddy Roosevelt. Now, William McKinley also was assassinated. He's one of the presidents that were killed. He was shot in 1901. And Teddy Roosevelt became president because of McKinley's assassination. Henry Adams was a historian and a professor at Harvard, not to mention he was the grandson of John Quincy Adams and great-grandson to John Adams, who were the president's of the United States. John Adams was the second president of the United States. And I want to say John Quincy was the fifth or sixth president. I can't remember. My apologies. Uh, Both men were close friends and their homes uh, for many years were one of the leading salons, alive and stimulating discussions about science, art, literature, et cetera. Um, Before Hay died in 1905, and Adams died in 1918. Some of the prominent guests that came to visit their homes were Teddy Roosevelt and even Mark Twain. So, lots of history. Hence why I want to go here so badly. Unfortunately, in 1927, D.C. developer Harry Wardman bought the homes and promptly tore them down. Oh. Kind of a dick move. Oh, I know. I don't, this guy, 
Um, and but then he built the Hay Adams House, which was a hundred and thirty-eight room apartment hotel, and he opened it in nineteen twenty-eight. But take a wild guess of what happened in nineteen twenty-nine. Nothing at all. The stock market crash of twenty-nine. <laughs> The great beginning of the Great Depression. Everybody lost their crypto. <laughs> All their NFTs were worth All their nothing. NFTs. You are hurting me, right? So bad. Like now it's, oh, <laughs> stop it. He doesn't mean this. He's, he's, he just knows he's just messing with me. Uh, Wardman <laughs> eventually defaulted on the loan in 1932, and the building was sold at auction to the Washington Loan and Trust Company. Uh, hotel magnate Julius Manger purchased the building that year and he decided to rename it the manger hay adams hotel because of course you gotta slap your name on what you own got to lame yeah, i know uh manger himself actually would later pass away suddenly in march of 1937 in his suite at the hotel um, and he was 69 years old uh, the hotel would eventually be sold by the Manger family in 1973 to developer Sheldon Magazine, who would change the name back to the Hay Adams Hotel. Prominent guests to the hotel included Amelia Earhart, <gasps> oh, Sadie. Charles Lindbergh, and even President Obama stayed at the hotel with his family for two weeks prior to his inauguration. So, by the way. Oh, go ahead. By the way, why like literally like within the week after we did that Amelia Earhart the Amelia Earhart episode, I was playing Starfield. I picked up Amelia Earhart's clone. Yeah, yeah, you told me about this. Power. I was like, holy crap, what are the odds? I know, right? That's cool. Case Synchronicities. Closed. We found we found her <laughs> clone. So I'm still uh been checking up on that story. They still have not gone back. Um, listeners, I'm just saying, I'm talking about our one of my previous episodes. If you hadn't listened to it, go back and check it out. Um, I've been keeping up with that, waiting to see, you know, when they're going to go back and check to see if that was actually Amelia Earhart's plane or not. So stay tuned. Um, now with all that said, the hotel is home to many paranormal happenings that they many seem to link to Henry Adams' wife. Marion Hooper Adams, or as she was known, Clover. She had a nickname. They called her. Her name was Clover. Uh, Clover Adams was actually an active photographer and was one of the earliest known portrait photographers. This is actually, I just sent this to you in Discord. That's a self portrait of Clover. Kind of creepy. Oh, so this wow. was the inspiration for Pyramid Head. <laughs> So this is Clover, which is your name was? I'm sorry. Cl Clo it's Clover Adams. She was the wife. Clover Adams. She was the wife to Henry Adams. Um, and this is a self-portrait because, as I said, she was an active photographer. She was actually one of the earliest known portrait photographers, though Henry did not really care for this. And so he kind of forbade her from really like going into it as a full career. Um, oh, well, it was the times, I guess. I don't know. She spent most of her free time taking and developing photographs. She learned she actually learned how to use the chemicals um, that were used for colonial photography at the time. Um, she processed all her own photographs. Unfortunately, Clover Adams had grown depressed, and she actually ended up taking her own life in December of 1885 by ingesting one of the key developing chemicals that you used in photography, which was potassium cyanide. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, poor dear. Yeah, they actually used potassium cyanide. Um, it was it was used to fix the wet plate collodial process. Um, it was preferred to other chemicals as it didn't contain sulfides, which, you know, darkening the highlights of the scene, it helped remove fog and leaving a clean, crisp, you know, image so that's kind of why oh, they neat. use yeah i didn't know that and i was a photographer uh -oh. too so once again <laughs> it's kind of a fun history lesson um there were rumors now as far as her depression go there were rumors that it may have been because there was rumors that henry adams was sort of a philanderer 
and she may have grown despondent over the fact that her, you know, if her husband was cheating on her, um, but wouldn't let her follow not, her dreams and cheating say, on her. Man, yeah. Come on now, man. <laughs> I was about to say, not that it was enough that he was just like completely shooting her dreams out of the air. Since yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there was even a conspiracy theory that Henry murdered her and made her drink the poison. But I, the thing is with all of these, I didn't find anything to really support this fear theory. Um, in fact, letters state that the household was a happy one. And Henry stated in letters that he was absurdly in love. Uh, Clover often spoke of Henry's devotion to her. So I don't know. Take it with a grain of salt. Okay. Uh, either way, the couple, they're actually buried together under a monument. And it, the monument is actually entitled Grief. And they're buried in Rock Damn. Creek. Yeah. And they're buried under Rock Creek Cemetery. This is a picture of the monument. Uh, where they're they're buried, kind of a little a little creepy, but it's entitled "Grief." Man, so, that's metal. Yeah. So take that as you will. I want to have like a gravestone like that, except you know the cowled figure has like just glowing LED red eyes and just that'd be that'd be awesome. You just want to send me through trauma every time I visit your grave. I mean, it's the gift that gets on giving. Uh huh. Whatever. So either way, but it's her ghost that is said to haunt the hotel. Um, now, mind you, when when she died, the hotel didn't even exist. But she died on you know right there on the mm -hmm. property where the hotel is now. Um, it is said that she's actually most active around December, which is the anniversary of her death. So they say usually around early December is when activity gets ramps up uh doors opening and closing on their own sounds of crying coming from nowhere because that's something oh. i want to hear is just ghost crying which is second that's to bad. which is second to ghost giggling both of them <laughs> uh, don't have any emotions already I, I yeah just don't <laughs> don't be happy don't be sad be stoic Oh, you'll love this, James. Staff Stoic. have claimed Stoic. to be sorry. I'm yeah. not a Philistine. Staff <laughs> claim to have been hugged by an unseen presence. Oh, hugged. She's affectionate. <laughs> Getting ghost hug. Uh, but she's also seen. She's also actually been seen mostly on the fourth floor. Why? I don't know. Um uh, but when she is seen, she will often ask those who see her. What do you want? So, yeah. <laughs> no she, hugs, huh? <laughs> I guess not. She also seems to know the housekeepers by name because she'll often, when they see her, sometimes they'll also, she'll also call them by name. Um, so, yeah. Also, interesting note, people have claimed to smell almonds when they see her. Oh, no. Can you guess why? Cyanide. Cyanide. Yeah, one of the key identifiers of cyanide is it smells like almonds. And many people who didn't even know were claiming to smell almonds, and they had no idea why until somebody put the two and two together. So, yeah. So that's the ghost of uh, of the Hay Adams house, or the Hay Adams can hotel, you, excuse me. Can y'all smell almonds? Right now? No, I mean, like, so there's a thing where, like, some people cannot smell all almonds. Really? Mm hmm I've, I've never I, sniffed an almond. I can smell I, almonds. I was thinking, I can't recall ever smelling an almond. Maybe I can't smell almonds. I can. Katie Katie has one of her dishes that she makes. My wife is a, an amazing cook. Um, and one of them, she uses almonds. She actually has up in the cabinet almond extract. So... Oh yeah, yeah, I can smell almonds. So, so I would know it if I was in the hotel because I'd be like, "Oh, that's almonds." Oh God, I'm getting out of here. So, hers is really what makes me sad. Like you know, like talented and and she's married somebody of wealth and stuff, but she's depressed and she takes her own life by taking potassium cyanide. It's just, uh. So yeah, so you know, if you guys ever go to uh, listeners, if you ever go to uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, want to have an experience, maybe book a room there in early December, and maybe you'll see Miss Clover. 
Maybe you'll get a hug. Maybe you'll get a hug. Or, or a wailing. Or you'll smell almonds. And now comes the crescendo of the story. The White House. It should come as no shock that the White House itself is supposed to be incredibly haunted. Now, this is where I get to have a little fun. I'm not having to use so much notes when it comes to the White House. The White House itself, George Washington actually never lived in the White House. Did you know that? No. Yeah. George Washington was the only president to never live in the White House. He picked, I think he he kind of, he finalized the designs for the Washington, for the White House itself, but he actually died in 1799. And the White House itself would not be built until 1801, I believe. So oh. John Adams and his wife Abigail were the first president and first wife to reside in the White House. And uh, Washington was very much involved in like uh, buying the land that would become Washington, D.C. and deciding that that would be the capital. There were many talks uh, early on about making New York City the capital and – but he decided on – he actually – they created – they bought the land and decided – and they named it Washington after George Washington. So that is why we have Washington, D.C. The White House – and the thing is it doesn't really surprise me that the White House itself would be an epicenter of a lot of paranormal activity. If you think about all the shit that's gone down in that house, um, you know – I'm trying to remember how many presidents we've had that have died in office, either from natural causes or assassinations. I mean, you had William Henry Harrison, Zachary Taylor, uh, Abraham Lincoln, um, uh, President Garfield, Kennedy, just to name a few um, who have actually died in office. And then, of course, you have a lot of family members who have died in office. Like I mentioned earlier, Woodrow Wilson's first wife died, um, you know. While living at the White House, Abraham Lincoln lost his son, died at the White House. So you have a lot of deaths that occur in this building, in this particular building. So, like I said, it's not really surprising the fact that this place is supposedly really haunted. But what's also neat about that is that many eyewitnesses aren't just your regular, you know joe off the street like you have harry oh, Truman. Yeah. you have presidents talking about mm -hmm. their experiences that's like, cool yeah like one case is harry truman himself um he was we, oh yeah there's a president before harry truman franklin delano roosevelt died while in office and so harry truman became president because he was the vice president he was sworn in um he talks about an experience in 1946 um his wife and daughter were out of town and he was woken up in the middle of the night by a knock on his door. So, you know, and the thing is when you're president of the United States, that's common to be woken up in the middle of the night because you're the president of the United States. And when shit goes mm -hmm. down, people are going to come and get you out of bed because you got to deal with it right then and there. Um, but when he opened the door, there was nobody, nobody there at all. Looked around, didn't see anybody. He's like, okay. He tries to go back to bed, and suddenly he starts hearing footsteps coming from his daughter's room down the hallway. But like I said, his wife and daughter were out of town. There was <laughs> nobody there. Truman even wrote about it to his wife in a letter saying something along the lines of, please come home soon. You need to protect me from these specters that are apparently <laughs> walking around and doing <laughs> stuff. Um, so... Yeah. Uh, oh, and then going back to uh, even before Truman, actually going back to Woodrow Wilson, um, during the Wilson administration, First Lady Edith Wilson actually attempted to have the Rose Garden um, that's there at the White House move from a different location. Now, the reason we have the Rose Garden is thanks to First Lady Dolly Madison, James Madison's wife. Um, Dolly Madison was the was the first lady who gave us the Rose Garden, and she was very proud of it. Um, but during Wilson's administration, his second wife um, had ordered to have the Rose Garden moved to a different location. So as the story goes, these workers began to start to relocate the roses, only to be abruptly stopped 
by Dolly Madison herself coming out of the White House at them in anger, shaking her finger. Thus, the Rose Garden is still where it's always been because Dolly Madison was not <laughs> going to let them. So oh. just imagine that like, oh, for fuck a no. <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't just one. They all saw this. They all witnessed Dolly Madison, whom they know what she looks like thanks to her portrait. Like, these men are about to start working on the garden, and all of a sudden, there comes the spectral ghost of Dolly Madison. Like, I would shit That'd myself. That'd be crazy. Yeah. Like, the idea Can of that I happening. Go ahead. I want to just ask... Um, were they doing any seances and stuff in the White House? Christina, get up. Are you reading my notes? It's like, okay. So, <laughs> yes. We're going to get to that too. Okay. So, I'm kind of going forward to go backward. Um, okay. One ghost in particular that people have seen, actually full on seen, is that of the ghost of Abraham Lincoln himself. And when I say that people have seen Abraham Lincoln, I'm not talking staff or some, you know, housekeeper or cook. Uh, queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands. <laughs> a queen. Staying in the Lincoln bedroom, she actually got woken up in the middle of the night to a knock at the door. But unlike old Harry Truman, where he just opened the door and nobody's there, she opened the door, and there standing right in front of her was Abraham Lincoln himself. Oh, my gosh. Including his stove uh, stovetop hat, or stovepipe hat. Is that how you put it? Stovepipe hat. Right in front of her. Only for a few <laughs> moments before abruptly disappearing. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. And she wasn't the only one to see Mr. Lincoln. Winston Churchill himself also had an encounter with Lincoln. I've heard that one, yeah. So as we were saying, uh, Queen Wilhelmina actually met Lincoln's ghost face-to-face. -face. The Queen of the Netherlands opened her door up to find Abraham Lincoln standing right in front of her. So, like, not just anybody, not just anybody, but a freaking queen. Holy Mu crap. Much to her terror. Freaked her out. Like, she gets woken up by a knock at the door like Truman. But unlike Truman, where he opened the door and nobody's there, she opens the door and there's Abraham Lincoln with his stove stovepipe hat and everything. Whoa. But the part I, w I wanted to make sure you were here for. So Winston Churchill also encountered Abraham Lincoln himself. So Churchill also staying in the Lincoln bedroom. And interesting side note, the Lincoln bedroom was originally Lincoln's office. When Abraham Lincoln was president there, there was no Oval Office. It was not had not been built yet. So Abraham Lincoln actually worked in what's today known as the Lincoln Bedroom. Um, that was his office. So it's not surprising that these encounters would happen there because that was commonly where you could find him back in the day if you went to go meet with him, which you could back during the Lincoln administration. Like people – you could actually just walk right up into the White House – during this time period. Um, so the way the story goes, Winston Churchill was taking a bath. And after he had finished in true Churchill form, he's walking through the bedroom, but as naked. <laughs> yeah. With a cigar or, or, and or a whiskey in hand, right? Actually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he had his cigar. He was naked and smoking a cigar. I don't think he had whiskey. Um, but as he came into the room, there by the fireplace was the transparent president, Abraham Lincoln. And he said that Lincoln looked deep in thought, wasn't looking at him. But in true Churchill form, standing there butt naked, he just states, Mr. President, you seem to have me at a disadvantage. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and Lincoln responded to this. With a smile and then vanished. <laughs> so not just like a residual thing like Lincoln responded to him by smiling at this comment. Now, of course, Churchill did move to the room across the hall after this happened. But... <laughs> He's like, fuck that man. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> but it, yeah. But it's just like, holy shit. Like, it's freaking Abraham Lincoln. Oh, um, yeah. 
and going back and, and so like it, a and fanfic the- crossover a presidential fanfic crossover i know right <laughs> but uh the thing is abraham lincoln you could almost some could ar- almost argue that he's the epicenter of the paranormal the reason for the paranormal activity in the white house so abraham lincoln like i said he lost bless his heart he lost two sons while he was alive um he lost his first son before he was president, but his second son died um, in 1863 or 1862, 1862, if I'm, 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 re- I'm recalling from memory. And one interesting thing about Abraham Lincoln is that he supposedly had a premonition of his own death, which he told friends about this. So anybody who doesn't know, Abraham Lincoln said that one night he dreamt that he was awoken to crying. The sounds of crying and wailing in the White House. And in the dream, he walked down into the main, uh, I want to say, rotunda or, or main area of the White House. And there was a coffin with the American flag draped over it. Um, and the, the story goes that Lincoln asked one of the soldiers standing there, who has died? The soldier responded, the president, sir, by an assassin's bullet. And he wow. told friends this, and it's documented. So, but Christina, you had asked about like seances. Yeah. After, so after he was assassinated, Mary Todd began holding seances. Um, in fact, if I remember correctly, before she died, she, I think she was holding seances. Yes, she was holding seances after their son's death in 1862, trying to make contact with him. Um, out of her grief and all of that. And this continued when after Abraham Lincoln died as well. So, yes. It, it, so it's not surprising that perhaps all of Mary Todd's efforts to reach her son and eventually her husband may have ended up opening a doorway that they never closed. So, yeah. But uh, even before that, too, uh, there have been reports of uh, a British soldier trying to burn a bed. Uh, one wife's, uh, one dignitary's wife staying at the White House woke up to find a British soldier trying to set fire to the bed. Um, what is this, Rebels? Well, My because, gosh. well, fun history fact, the War of 1812, the British actually marched into D.C. and set fire to the White House, um, along with other structures in the city. Luckily, they were... They did not successfully burn down the buildings, but there are actually even today some bricks that are still purposely been left that were charred by that fire as a way to remember history. Uh, Bill Clinton actually talked about it up on the um, the back, you know, the back side of the White House with the pillars where often, you know, that we know um, and mm-hmm. the balcony up there. When Bill Clinton actually talked about sitting up there and you can actually see part of the bricks that are still charred from the fire and thought he always thought that was really interesting um but yeah so it's not surprising that a british soldier there's also been reports of what has been known as the thing uh yeah so as the story goes is it clobbering time i know right (laughs) it's believed actually it's a child so i'm trying to remember exactly how the story goes i'm pulling this by memory too but the way the story goes is that so there's for the longest time there was this unknown entity uh going about in the white house that would i want to say tug on people's clothes uh the maid's clothes and that sort of thing and colonel archibald gracie who was close friends with president cleveland at the time started to investigate this because eventually one of the ladies who felt their loves, their clothes t- uh, tugged on, caught a glimpse of the entity and she re- recorded or she her report said that it was a boy with blue eyes. Um, and she only saw him for but a moment before he just disappeared. Um, so Archibald Gracie started to kind of try to investigate what was going on because apparently it was driving President Cleveland nuts the whole ghost activities thing it was actually president taft howard taft 
forgive me. Um, Archibald mm. Gracie was close friends with Howard Taft. And Gracie started to investigate who the identity of this boy may have been. Now, I mentioned that Lincoln's son had died, but from all reports, the boy itself looked to be about the age of 14. And Lincoln's son did not was not 14 when he died. He was much younger than that. I think he was eight. Oh. But unfortunately, Gracie did not was not able to conclude his investigation because unfortunately, Archibald Gracie boarded the Titanic in <gasps> 1912. It's always the Titanic. It's always oh the Titanic. Oh my gosh. How many people were on that thing for real? Uh, <laughs> about 2,200 people. <laughs> so, yeah. That's crazy. Dang it. I messed up again. So funny thing, there's Archibald Gracie and then there's Archibald Butt. And they were both on the Titanic. Mm. So correction again. Archibald Butt. But. But. <laughs> but. <laughs> yeah. Um, Archibald, his full name was Archibald Willingham de Graffenride Clarendon Butt. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, that name was too much. Well, he was, he was, yeah, <laughs> he was from Georgia. Um, he was, he was close friends with uh, uh, President Taft, and unfortunately, he went down with the Titanic. Oh man, yeah, it's bad so, luck. So yeah, unfortunately, Archibald Butt was not able to finish his investigation, and I guess nobody ever continued that. So. I guess you could say that whole situation ended ass up. Wow. <laughs> I have no words. Oh. But anyway, that sort of concludes my episode on the ghosts of Washington, D.C. Now, like I said, I could continue talking on and on about all the other places that are supposedly haunted. And that's just a few of the ghosts that they claim or that have been seen in the in the White House itself. Um, but if you like this episode, if you'd like me to talk more about haunted locations and uh, especially or ghosts of DC, let us know in the comments, or uh, you can email us at littlepodcasthorrors at gmail.com. With that, do you guys have any uh, questions or comments or? No, Anything? but I definitely want you to do more of these haunted DC, but also we need to do a, a field trip yes. as well. I would love to do a field trip. Now, some of the things that I kind of was investigating, I'm trying to remember what the name of the hotel was. There's another hotel that Ulysses S. Grant frequented. He loved this hotel. Um, it's the Willard Hotel. Um and I remember this story as well. Ulysses S. Grant, like every day. And and this just, just kind of shows you how different things were back then. So when Ulysses S. Grant would finish his presidential work for the day, because I guess back then it was just sort of like, well, five o'clock, I'm out. Uh, <laughs> he, he would actually just walk over to the Willard Hotel, which you couldn't even fathom a president doing that now. Where it's no. like, you know, like Biden just like, well, I'm done for the day. I'm going to stroll over to the Willard Hotel, just like you're just like out and about and like, oh, there's the president of the United States just walking down the street. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant would just hang out at this hotel. And another fun fact, because he would always hang out in the lobby, oftentimes people would come to try to talk with Grant about things, uh, try, you know, senators and representatives um, or actually people who worked for senators and and representatives, which is why we have the term lobbyists today. Oh, no way. Okay. Because they would come to try to talk with Ulysses S. Grant while he sat there in the lobby. Now, not to ever disclaim anybody's claims of ghosts, but the story goes that people believe that Ulysses S. Grant may haunt the lobby because oftentimes people can still smell his cigars because if you remember Ulysses Grant was renowned for smoking his big cigars now the thing about that though is that walls absorb those smells 
Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. it's just it's just science. It's what happens. And during the summer, during extreme temperature changes, walls can secrete the smells they have absorbed. So it's really quite possible that when they're smelling Ulysses S. Grant's cigars, which I believe they are, it's not as ghost. It's just the walls secreting the years and years of absorbing his cigar smoke cigar smoke which in itself is still cool because like you're smelling yeah. ulysses s grant's cigars but yeah that's pretty cool yeah so there's lots of fun things about that and the willer hotel is another place i would just love to visit just for historical reasons so yeah but yeah i would love to talk more about uh haunted locations but more importantly um haunted cities of real historical significance and what like i said washington dc these were just a few of the places um that i decided to talk about there are many more stories throughout this historic town the smithsonian the decanter house um the octagon house um, which is also supposed to be haunted by Dolly Madison as well. So James was talking about earlier about ghosts kind of moving around. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, because Dolly Madison's been seen at the Octagon House and she's been seen at the White House. So, yeah. dang, so. yeah, do a another one for this. Right. <laughs> do another one now. I don't care what everybody else thinks. I'm requesting it, so that makes what, it important. What does everybody else think? <laughs> And I don't care how many people think you're full of shit, Chris. You know what I mean. So. Yeah. James, any any comments or questions? Man, I got nothing. This is just all presidential. 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 Yeah. Thank you for listening to Little Podcast of Horrors. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, and share. Uh, got a true tale of the unexplained? Send us an email at littlepodcasthorrors at gmail.com or visit our website.